Thank you. Thank you. I'm like you. I think I'm like right at the end of uh, being a Generation Xer. I'm like a week in, but um, I am more than willing and happy to shave mm, 10 years off of my age to fit for this. That's completely fine. So. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, yes, as, uh, as you were saying, my father was uh, Father Keith Roderick. And um, before I start, I wanted to show uh, a picture that uh, hung in his office. And before there was Parkland, before Virginia Tech, and before Columbine, nine Coptic youth, this, these youth right here, were murdered in a mass shooting in a Coptic church in Egypt during a youth group gathering. This picture hung on my father's wall, whether it was at his church office or when he worked at a college or even when he was here in Washington, D.C. This was a fixture. I always looked for it when I entered his office. This picture shadowed him each and every day as a great reminder of the fragility of practicing the Christian faith in the persecuted world. I'm going to put this down here. <laughs> I know when he looked at the faces of these young men and women, he saw the faces of his own children. He carried the images of bold ridden pews and the blood splattered walls and floors of this church with him until the day he died. Those images not only haunted him, but they ingrained in my memory as well. I was actually about the same age as many of these uh, Coptic, young Coptic martyrs when this, actually, when this occurred. I can vividly recall the evening after the tragedy. I was home sulking because a friend of mine had canceled plans to go to a coffee house, because that was the thing to do in the 90s, you know, that was the cool thing, like we were on Friends. And I remember my father coming and telling me about what had happened to these, these young people. And suddenly, it was like a lightning strike that just went through my soul. I thought, how trivial are my problems compared to these? They were simply going to a church to gather and to pray and to worship, and they were killed. Prior to these events in Egypt, I wasn't, a, I wasn't immune to the plight of religious and ethnic minorities in the world. My father began his human rights work around the time I was born, which I'm not going to say what year that was, so <laughs> we'll get past that. But his work first uh, centered in the Soviet Union. I was actually probably the only first grader at the time who was familiar with the workings of the KGB or even what it meant, so if that gives you any indication of my childhood. When the Soviet Union began to fall, my father switched his focus to the Middle East and Africa. He was introduced by a man named Dr. Shai Karras. And if I may digress for just a moment, if there is one name besides my father's name that I want you to remember today, it is Dr. Shai Karras. He tirelessly spent years going back to the 60s, probably the 50s, going through the halls of Congress, going through, knocking on the doors here, trying to get members to listen to him, to listen to the plight of the Christians, the persecuted Christians in Egypt. He was doing this before all of us. We even knew what was going on. He paved the way, and we owe a debt of gratitude to him for opening those doors for us. So I, I hope that you do remember his name. When my father and Dr. Karras joined forces, there were only a handful of people advocating for pers the persecuted under Islamization. I can remember those early meetings with my father and Dr. Karras, Dr. Walid Ferris, Nina Shea, Ambassador John Hanford, Ann Bawalda, and there's a few familiar faces in here, such as uh, Michael Horowitz, Sharon Pate, and our own Faith McDonnell. Uh, so I remember them when I was a young girl. Some of them may not have remembered me or noticed me, but I, yes, <laughs> I certainly, I, <laughs> I certainly remembered them, and they had quite an impact on me. Then there were a few congressmen. There were only a few congressmen at the time, leading the way. It was Congressman Frank Wolf and Chris Smith, 
followed by Senators Brownback and Lieberman, who were among the first to highlight the atrocities being committed against religious and ethnic minorities. They never bowed to the pressure from secular or pro-Islamist lobbies. They were unafraid to wear their faith on their sleeves and never caved out of fear of being perceived as culturally insensitive. It was these individuals who warned the West and the religious leaders of a cauldron of fanaticism brewing in the Islamic world. Eventually, it would boil over into the West. Unfortunately, before it boiled over, millions of Christians would either be killed, enslaved, or displaced because of their faith. My father, along with several members of various religious and ethnic groups, formed a coalition to combat the growing Islamization threat in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. The coalition had no funding for paid staff, so my father did what any good father would do. He recruited his five children to help. <laughs> Our parents refused to shelter us from the dark realities of the world. At the time, I thought it was just a tactic used to make us feel guilty for not eating our peas, but I now know they had, they had good intentions. <laughs> My brothers and I would attend coalition meetings with our father, usually here in the D.C. area, and soon those members became like family to us. After a while, my brothers either lost interest or, quite frankly, they weren't very good at clerical work. So knowing my brothers is probably the latter. But I kind of took it on. My dad asked me to help him out. So a couple days a week, I would go to my father's office after school and spend a few hours mailing letters, sending faxes, filing, whatever I could do for the coalition. I couldn't help but absorb some of the things I would read and see. I recall coming across a diagram of a description of a Lebanese Christian man who had been tortured in a Syrian prison. I remember the pictures of people who had received lashes across their backs for publicly professing their faith. There were much worse pictures, but my father shielded me from those that were the pictures of decapitated bodies or charred bodies, people who had been burned alive. Attending coalition meetings with my father was not only eye-opening, but it was actually enjoyable, too. I was always welcomed and never treated like a pestering child or teenager. I was included in dinners and discussions, and I certainly took an active interest in the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. It was difficult to ignore those in my family, especially around dinner time when that was usually the discussion. <laughs> At the time, it didn't dawn on me why my presence was so important to these members. I continued attending events throughout college and even as a young adult while I was living and working here in the Washington, D.C. area. I thought as a young adult my presence was more nostalgic and a chance to visit with people who had become like family to me. I honestly didn't think at the time I had much to offer to the cause. My father was doing amazing work and as a 20-something-year-old, what new perspective did I have for the cause? I begged my father a couple of times to allow me to accompany him to, to the Middle East. Uh, I still had that interest. But my dad, I guess, father knows best. I had to accept that. He said, no, no, no. He saw the dangers that were arising. He saw the rise of groups like ISIS and Boko Haram way before they reached the West. And he worried about my safety. I took it as a sign perhaps God had other plans for me. It wasn't until I received the worst phone call in my entire life in the middle of the night in March of 2014, while I was living in Japan, that changed, that all changed for me. The moment I heard my father had passed, I knew his work must live on. Before the sun rose in the land of the rising sun, my family agreed that I should carry on his work. My, death, my father's death reignited a passion in me that had gone dormant. I may not have inherited money, an antique car, fine art from my father, but what I inherited was a priceless sense of purpose, 
and longing to be a voice for the voiceless. A few months after my father's passing, I was privileged to participate in the Coptic Solidarity Conference here in D.C. I was honored to accept an award on behalf of my father. In attendance were many of those original coalition members who I had known since I was a little girl. It was then that I learned the reason I was always included and welcomed. It was because they felt it was vital to have a young person involved and witness to what was going on. They feared the movement would die with them. It's sad it took the images of children being born, burned alive in cages and little girls being auctioned as sex slaves and the kidnapping of hundreds of girls in Nigeria and Christians having to flee their homes out of fear of death for the West to wake up and see what was happening. Now, thankfully, there are multiple organizations today that are dedicated to protecting Christians and other religious minorities. However, the fight for religious equality is far from over. We have seen an assault on Christianity in our own country. The un undermining of Christians and, and Judeo-Christian values has been in the works for the past 50 years. As Christians, we find ourselves at a crossroads of preserving Judeo-Christian values in the West and protecting Christianity in the East. Our society has evolved from rejection to apathy to ignorance towards Christians in a few generations. Having spent a few years working in public ed education, I don't see the hostility towards Christians among children. I see a yearning for faith and purpose. Many of our youth in America are just simply lost sheep. They look towards celebrity for celebrities for moral guidance. They are looking for a sense of community and belonging. They are tired of this endless penance for, the West, for Western imperialism. They're tired of that. They're tired of hearing, we're the bad guys. It is a penance in which Christians in the East are paying the ultimate price. We have an opportunity to engage youth in Christian schools and homeschooling groups, and they are growing at bounds. They are growing. Children are most receptive to a message of hope and goodness, to touch on what you said. Rather than anger and revenge, if we are going to save Christianity in the East, we must save it here in the West. It is time we expose children to the unwavering faith of our brothers and sisters in the East. They are truly a testament of our faith. It's time that we stop sheltering our youth from the truth, which only leads to further apathy and ignorance. If hundreds of thousands of youth can be moved to action by senseless acts of violence by a few disturbed individuals, imagine sharing the faces of fellow youth killed at the hands of an ideology that is protected by the PC police. Those nine Coptic young martyrs who were killed 20 years ago were my impetus to get involved. There are thousands of Christians throughout the East that have been murdered or enslaved that should serve as a call to activism for millions of youth in the West. I'm here today because my parents believed it was important to show my brothers and I that freedom of religion is not to be taken for granted. We were witnesses to unsung heroes who stood in the face of evil and were not afraid to proclaim their faith. If these values and dedication to our faith that I hope that we pass down to my sister who joins us today, she's 15 years old, an example of who we are trying to reach, as well as my nephews. When my husband who's in the Navy, 
questions my sanity for urging him to pursue orders back to this area, to the swamp and the nightmarish traffic. I tell him it is because of these nine Coptic lives who were cut short for just living their faith. I found my voice when their voices were silenced. In closing, I know there's a lot of frustration among us for the, the lack of activism on part of our fellow Christians in the West. However, I can tell you that in the last three decades, of, since I was a little girl coming to these meetings, I have seen a progression of awareness. 25 years ago, we could have been in this very room and hosted a summit on what is Christian persecution. Today, it is why don't Christians care about Christian persecution? Tomorrow, it will be what can Christians do to help the persecuted? I can't help to think that Dr. Karras and my father are looking down pleased knowing that Christians in the West have progressed from not knowing about persecution to not caring. As crazy as that sounds, it is, it is progress. Awareness is half the battle, and the knowledge is priceless in this fight. With our passion and dedication to the persecuted, we can do it. We can cultivate our brothers and sisters, especially those who are young, here in the West to take action. It can be done. We have seen, we have seen progression, and we have to stick to our faith and the message that our brothers and sisters in the East, that their faith is worth living for and their lives are not to be taken in vain. Thank you.